Of the three men examined for this assignment, I found all three to be sincere in their mutual desire for racial uplift. Du Bois, Hawley, and Tolson shared a common desire. They may have had common desire, but diametrically opposed ideologies can also be found. Perhaps a singular focus amongst the black elitist of the day might have procured expedited results. It may also be true that the clash of ideologies was good for the discourse and good for the cause. Whatever the case, these three men worked tirelessly to advance the plight of the African American post emancipation. I will begin with Du Bois. His insatiable thirst for knowledge would be inspiring in any period of time, but the fact that he found incredible learning opportunities both at home and abroad is admirable. A defining moment for him came, I feel, while he was a student in Germany, as evidenced by the quote on this slide. I cannot help but think that this freedom from racism helped shape his burgeoning views of elevating his race to equality with the white man. A proper education, he strongly believed, was the key. This is where Du Bois differed sharply from his counterparts, chiefly Booker T. Washington and Joseph Hawley. Both these men felt that black young people would derive more benefit from an industrial education that prepared them for a life in the service sector. Du Bois disagreed. He envisioned an education rich in the humanities. When confronted with the relevance these lofty areas of study would have to his race, he countered with brilliance, as evidenced by this quote. The cornerstone of Du Bois' model, however, was political equity by way of democracy. It was essential for the African American to hold the power to vote and have a voice in his own destiny. This component to his framework took root in his childhood in New England when he saw firsthand that a person could be thoughtfully heard simply because he or she was a landowner who paid taxes. Holly, however, espoused racial inferiority although interestingly enough did not seem to apply this theory to his own person. His benefactor Hazard urged forward this philosophical thinking and encouraged the training at the ABMTI to teach men and women to be trained in vocations that would be of service to white business owners. It would appear to me that Holly unwittingly brokered backdoor slavery. Blacks were a means to an end, not an end in and of themselves. O'Brien states on page 840 that Hawley had every intention initially of aiding in the uplift of his race, but ultimately he fell short, instead consumed with, his, with advancing his own celebrity. Melvin Tolson's brand of resistance followed on two fronts. He secretly met with sharecroppers to form and organize a union and worked tirelessly to find debate opportunities on white stages and sought to use accepted forms of argument to bring about uplift and strategic change. Film can be a powerful form of pedagogy or of propaganda. The image in the movie of that lynched and burned black man is haunting. Knowing those things really happened and in my lifetime is jarring. Hitler used film to convince a nation that Jews were no better than vermin. And Hollywood is a clearinghouse today of dialogue about everything from corrupt government practices to climate change. I'd like to add a personal reflection here. I grew up in Ferguson, Missouri and attended an integrated school. One day my friend and classmate Esther, an African American, asked me if I had ever wondered what it would be like to be black. I felt she was searching for a right answer and I wasn't sure how to respond. I finally had to admit that no, I never had. Seeking to somehow amend my feelings, I asked her the reverse question. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be white? The longing in her voice was unmistakable, and I will never forget it. All the time was her quiet response. It was my first moment of utter awareness that there was a great divide in my country, in my city, and even between my friend and myself. Through no fault or choosing of our own, I was on the right side of that divide, and Esther was on the wrong. And so, I must ask these questions, because people like my friend Esther demand it. These questions leave me wondering, what if voices like Tolson and Du Bois had been stronger and more influential? Might we have more blacks in leadership roles today? Would we have the current bloated welfare roles which might be considered a modern day form of enslavement? 
would my beloved hometown of Ferguson have been set on fire and looted for the entire country to watch? These are difficult questions, and there are no easy answers. To me, social justice is this. We treat all people as equals, no exception. This is the world men like Du Bois and Tolson envisioned and worked toward.